You can love something and let it go It's hard to see it in the moment But the best things always hurt the most yeah. If I could, I'd never let you go But my heart's fighting my conscience And you don't deserve the fallout Being pulled down in my own toe You can want something so bad that it doesn't want you Yeah, I want it is so bad that somewhere I lost you, yeah This is the end But it's not over We've never been closer Someday I will see you again, yeah This is the end But it's not over Hey everybody! Woo. Welcome back from the weekend. Hi. Yo, know, everybody's working for the weekend, Bryce. I've heard that. I have heard that. <laughs> they want to. That's they funny, want man. Oh, yeah. Though I was working this weekend, so. Oh, were you? Yeah, a little bit. Well, then, what are you working for now? <sighs> Respect. <laughs> personhood. <laughs> Actually, I think I think I think I'm not working this weekend, so I think that'll be good. Oh well, that's good. Yeah. I'll be in town. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we. Oh, you know that uh, we need to. We should get we should get you and Brian to do a trending lemon while you're in town. Should that'd be fun. Should first three should person. Probably, that'd be that'd be a good thing to do because uh, we also need to bang out in a, a night attack, right? Yeah, yeah, we do. <laughs> so uh, yeah, sorry about that. You uh, not working uh, this week. Ah, <laughs> no, that's fine. The podcast, the podcasts are easy. <laughs> Oh my goodness! How's everybody doing? Uh, I'm doing pretty good, man. Doing pretty good. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I watch some stuff. Well, I have things to talk about. I'm not gonna uh, be like lo- furiously thumbing through my uh, uh, Audible library to pull some old <laughs> audiobook as a uh, as as a recommendation Let's pick. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I my problem is I take forever to listen. Like I've been listening to the Three Body Problem for like two weeks. And oh, like, I'm, that's like a I'm, heavy book, though. Right? I'm reading that's it right book. now. I hope you're enjoying it more than I am. Uh, I I well I <laughs> I made it through uh uh 198Q uh yeah yeah 198Q yeah um and uh <laughs> oh man that one made me mad <laughs> because uh. That doesn't. That's. I haven't read that book, but uh, what I know about that book doesn't seem like a thing you would like. Uh, yeah, like literally well, nothing I mean, happens. Well, that's a different author, though. I mean, like, that's not the same guy. What, what yeah, if there were author, multiple yeah. worlds and then nothing happened in either of them? The end. <laughs> oh, so counterpart. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh! kind of. Hey, oh, shots fired. Uh, Justin Marks, uh, coming at us. Sorry. Um, yeah, well, one two eight four. That's a different author, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah three yeah. body. Like, at least the guy. This his guy. Science is great. You know, I'm like, his science is great. His references are great. I'm just like, I'm like a third into it. I'm like, here's a premise, and then I'm just like waiting for stuff to happen. And... One Q eight four. Excuse us. One Q eight four. Yeah. Thank Q84. you. Thank you, Lorman. Uh, uh, are uh, you guys yeah. reading? Are you guys reading the three party bo- three body problem because they're going to make a movie of it very soon? No, I'm. No. It was oh, just okay. recommended on something. Oh, uh, it was uh, actually on the Reason podcast. Uh, somebody recommended it, oh, so okay. so I jumped in. It was highly recommended. Um, I don't know. Like uh, I got up to that that scene where somebody says, "Hey, can you make that shot?" Uh, in the pool table and then they move the pool table around and they're like five for five uh, it's great and then that, that moment that somebody realizes oh wait what you're describing with you know uh, physics changing based on time and place that that 
that's a I, real thing. I, that's cool. I mean, I, I got. I mean, there's some cool things. I'm just for me. I'm just like it's so slow. I'm just just. It's like I'm spending so much time. I mean. I, I, I enjoyed those moments. I think they're really well written. I think it's very, very well. But like, uh, you know, an equivalent would be like, uh, God, what's the fantasy book everybody loves? Uh, Name of the Wind or whatever. Yeah. I, I could. I just I'm like, man, nothing happened. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, I'm like, what a, what a long prelude, you know, but everybody else loves it. So I'm like, yeah, I'm wired differently. I had that with a movie recently, too. Yeah. What movie? Uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Anyway, <laughs> you uh, stuff happens. I, I'll explain to you. I can hey, tell you what happened. Hey. So, it, you're I mean, right. You're right. Something you're does happen. So, if, if, by the end. end. A round robin of explaining uh, <laughs> why a thing that somebody else thought was bad is indeed Yeah, let's not. Let's, let's not. Uh, you guys, uh, uh, let's jump into the show. How about that? Let's do show? it. Let's do it. All right. Let me give you this, and then I'm going to count you in. All right. Let's do the show in three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. Justin Robert Young. Why, hi, friends. How are you? And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Oh, I'm over here. Hello. Gentlemen, uh, some stories to talk about here. Uh, there was a little bit of a news that came out last week. We didn't cover it because I was waiting to find out more details. But um, imagine this. There's a radiation detector in some cities in Russia. Uh -oh. Radiation detector spikes a bit. People get a little bit worried. Maybe there's an article in a Russian newspaper about a possible nuclear accident. And then uh, a day later, that article's gone. Th th this has to be science fiction, right? It's not like we can name any other event or time that this actually happened. Not yeah, if you're I mean, based it's... in Moscow, you can't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I so mean, aside, there, aside from that one time that the CIA agents came in and <laughs> demolished a, uh, a Russian nuclear facility. Wait, oh, wait they, what was that? Uh, what? That's uh, uh, among the popular theories uh, uh, about what happened with, with Chernobyl, uh, including uh, the, the success of the series has now uh, uh, led Russia to uh, commission their own series, and that's going to be part of the plot. Is that what? there is American interference? That oh, a Hong Kong protest, CIA too. You didn't know that? Oh yeah, my gosh! That's, that's, uh... <laughs> All right, yeah, that's it. Like that's legit the thing that those media will do to say CIA. It's like, and there's no American equivalent to this too. When we're unhappy about the way something goes, we have no version of this that we use when we want to. Blame I mean, actually, somebody actually, else. we do. It's just no, Illuminati. It's, right. it's Illuminati confirmed, is what we say, <laughs> but it means oh, the same no, thing. Uh, yeah, that I mean, there's some other. We don't blame some other country though. We never say this. You know, we never say something something meddling. We don't say that. Yeah, sure. The Patriot Act meddling. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Got him. So yeah, I, it's it's funny because it's like. Is he looking like, oh, they're blaming the CIA? Like, oh, wait, we do that too. <laughs> you know, we're not so different, you and yeah. I. Yeah. So, so, so I, I actually I, don't yeah. know this story. Um, I... The story is apparently Russia, you know, likes to develop like really kind of crazy. Like, they like to say, like, oh, we're developing this crazy thing. And often they just do it for PR value. It's like, oh my God, they're going to develop, you know, a flying shield helicarrier or whatever. Like, no, they're not. They said they are, but they're not. Uh, but one thing they announced they were trying to develop was a uh, nuclear-powered missile. And so basically a nuclear-powered missile is using, uh, you know, uh, radiation to heat up your fuel to make it go really friggin' fast. And so they denounced they're working on something just before and may have tested this. They think that may have been what exploded, but it doesn't maybe have the same prototype, you know, signature of what they think. But um, some think, think it may involve just some sort of nuclear propulsion system that exploded. This was was this the the story where it's like, hey, even if you develop uh, develop an anti missile shield, we're in the, the middle of creating missiles that'll go so fast that won't matter. Yes, I mean that's kind of the idea is if you build something so fast, you can you can counteract you know the the measures for it or go faster than the counter you know countermeasures. Um, the only the problem though is is that if your missiles explode before they launch on your own territory, self defeating. Yeah, that I mean, would traditionally be described as suboptimal. If if anything else, I mean, it does kind of lend some credibility to their claim that if they don't have it today, they're certainly serious about working on it. 
Sure. Oh yeah, their 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 weapons program is serious about doing stuff. You know, it's just the, you know, the 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 challenge comes into you can get some engineers together. You can get a group of engineers to say, hey, we think we can make a prototype for this. And that's what they've been doing. And maybe it won't get to a point where it won't blow up. But then if you want to scale it into production, that's where it gets super expensive. And and that's one of the problems of a lot of weapon stuff. We've built one. We built this advanced weapon system. It's like, great. You got the prototype. But, you know, if, if you're going to be a threat, you need to build more in theory. Although sometimes all you need is one bomb. I mean, I don't know. Traditionally, it takes two to really get the message in. Yeah, <laughs> don't know what that reference is about at all. Uh, so it's curious. We're finding out, and it's the hard part is is that you know you're dealing with a state media that you know shuts these things down completely, and so we don't know what's going on. And it, to Brian's point, it's like yeah, like we don't you know we can laugh it off and go ha 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 yeah good luck on that, and then one day you find out oh yeah no we figured it out and we're we have a lot of them. Yeah. Um. No. Um, so. Something to think about. I mean, what's the coolest thing you've heard about, like weapons wise or, you know, crazy theoretical? I, uh, the latest thing that, that really caught my attention is the, the fact that uh, in the Hong Kong protests going on right now, we have a real life conflict where police and law enforcement are using chemical warfare and protesters are responding with lasers. <laughs> To blind them. Yeah. I mean, that's the that's a fairly remarkable sci-fi real life thing that's happening. And what's funny is, on the one hand, um, you know, there's nothing great about anybody getting hurt in the middle of this con conflict, but um, uh, everybody's playing by gentlemen's rules. Like clearly, neither side wants a single human fatality. They're just both trying to to do their jobs. It's really weird. And to, f the the lasers they're using are to stop facial recognition systems, not to blind the cops. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's and also like, I I don't know enough about what's really going on in the scene to speak to who's really playing by rules or not. But it is fascinating to see. I don't know if you saw the video of where you see like thousands of laser pointers aimed at the cameras. Uh, uh, and it, it, I I the the one I saw, and that's the other thing is this is part of me that that the artist to be adores that they're working together to create the ultimate rave scene. Like we'll show yeah. up with the smoke bombs, you show up with the light show, and we'll get this amazing yeah. cyberpunk vignette. Yeah, uh, but it's it's yeah. There we go. Look at the the those are all the lasers. I'm watching a video right now of lasers trying aim at every camera and stuff to try to stop, and it's you know. Uh, it's, it's, it's from, it's from amazing. here, it looks amazing. It's beautiful. It's you know? amazing. From there, I think, you know, is, you know, there are tanks massing on the border. It's probably a little bit terrifying. Well, and they're, they're shooting it at like this sort of domed structure. And so it makes it look like, like a, a, a you know, like a DJ set or something, right? Like a big stage show. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there's like a projection on it and there's, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, that's the only thing that's there's, missing. There, there's a lot going on and, and, uh, uh it is, is it, it, it is a remarkable cyberpunk, uh, uh, visual to understand that it looks like that. And yet what we are talking about is a, a, relative to the region and certainly to the rest of what is uh, uh, nominally the country, uh, a very free thinking people that are teetering on the edge of, you know, being crushed under the boot heel of a totalitarian state. You know, I, and I was wondering, even I, I was a child, what was it, 1990, 1989, that the handover happened? I, I think I was... 97 was the handover. Uh, okay, so. okay. I, I remember uh, at the time thinking like, well, how long how long can China treat it like uh, Hong Kong? And at some point, at what point does China try to Chinify this British colony? And uh, and I guess we're here. I guess twenty twenty years plus is, is the number. Twenty two years. Yeah. There we go. The answer. Uh, and even then, it was uh, you know by by degrees. I mean, what they are what they are protesting about is extradition. That like this is the thing that as soon as the the Beijing is able to just kind of disappear people out of Hong Kong that you lose the rest of it. Whatever and, and, I thought Hong Kong had, that's that's a wrap. To be honest, I, I'll bet you could go back and uh, about, I'll bet there is a number of futurologists who had pegged that as being the issue because uh, that's that's a pretty good issue. That's pretty black and white. 
that that's not about like taxation. It's not about, you know, whether you do or don't care about uh, political control one way or the other. Like if you're talking about like, no, 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 you're doing the thing where you make people disappear uh, and you're not going to do that here because that's not us. I mean, and, and this is now we are into months, plural, of street protests. They shut down the Hong Kong International Airport uh, for two full days. Uh, and, and by the way, that is only the story. I mean, compare when the Hong Kong International Airport got shut down versus when the Gatwick Airport got shut down because of the mysterious drone thing. That was such a bigger story in the Western media, mostly because reporters could just copy and paste tweets from everybody who was affected globally, right? But they're writing in English by and large if they're flying through Gatwick. Uh, there's like so much of that Hong Kong traffic. Obviously, much of it is English, but not as much as people that are going from London somewhere else or stopping over through London and are, are, are likely going to English speaking countries like that is massive. You shut down the Hong Kong International Airport, considering what a huge bulwark that is for uh, uh, Asian travel writ large. Like I've flown through there twice and I think I've gone to Asia like four times, <laughs> like uh, half of all of my uh, uh, trips through there have at some point spent multiple hours at the Hong Kong United Club. Well, and, and also it's smart if you want Western attention, that's the way you get it is have Westerners who suddenly can't go home and have them really think about how this is going to go. Yeah. You know, the, it's also an interesting contrast because it's like you see where Hong Kong is still largely, you know, is freer than China, the other parts of China. And you get an example of this is what people can do when they have more open forms of media. They don't have to go through VPMs and they can communicate versus how China internally is able to shut this stuff down. You know, like literally like, you know, they control their version of Twitter. They control their version of these. The state controls these things and can stop these things, can stop people from getting. They can shut down cell phone networks and they can prevent people from getting together entirely. You know, and it's just a, it's from a point of tech, the science fiction point of view is like this is what it's like when you can freely you have the technology to get yourself to freely assemble versus over there where the government has kill switches on everything. It can stop that, you know, pretty much before it gets going. And for groups of people who use lower tech ways, well, we have these reeducation centers and stuff. Are they yeah. are they using any of the, the crazy weird things uh technologies that we've talked about before like uh, sonic weapons or anything or microwaves to to disperse crowds and and if not how long until they do because a lot of these these things we've talked about before have been you know uh, chinese developed technologies well you you have you have the hong kong police which are trying to manage the situation and then you have the chinese outside saying this is what we've done so hong kong police are in a very precarious position because they if they start to turn too much on, you know, what's going on that, you know, uh, using like there's some photos of like some of the, the, the stuff, you know, the, it, the more extreme the measures they do, the bigger, the you know, it's it's, you know, it's so funny they're, because yeah. like it's a literal war of stories. It's it's there are two stories to be told and each one has to play this game of brinksmanship to get as close to physical violence as possible and try to lure uh, the I, other I, side part of that into part, overstepping. Part of that is, Part of that is that the, the the Hong Kong police don't want to be on the other side of this, right? right? Yeah, yeah. They, I mean, they're they're Hong Kong police, right? They're playing yeah, exactly. for the Hong Kong they're like, team. They're like, look, we would much rather just be issuing parking tickets. Like, we don't want to be the tip of the spear of Beijing, and yet they have to be. Uh, uh, they are nominally the like uh, uh, the way that China can say, oh no, this is just an inner Hong Kong thing. You know, you got a bunch of protesters mucking things up and the brave police are doing everything that they can to make sure that it's uh, uh, handled accordingly. But then meanwhile, look, China's got a problem on their hands. <laughs> and, and did I, did I talk about... Did I tell about what the the, 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 the Chinese-sponsored protests when I was in New York? No. Oh. So when I was at the... I went to Thriller Fest and I was staying at the Grand Hyatt... Um, the president of Taiwan was staying there because there was some sort of negotiation stuff. So just background, because, and I apologize to everyone, 
Taiwan is a separate or country from China, although China considers it a territory, right? There was a you know breakaway republic because after this of the Civil War and and the you know loyalists went to there and they formed the Taiwanese government and they have this weird relationship. China considers Taiwan part of China. Taiwan considers itself sovereign. <laughs> yeah, the, the the weird relationship is uh uh hey, that's cool that you think we're a territory. We think we're an independent country. Also, we've got a fair number of missiles. So let's circle back to this never. <laughs> and then yeah, that's... And, and, and you get into... It gets weird because of that. But like you take a company like Foxconn, right? Which makes iPhones, all this sort of stuff. Which you talk about, oh, the Foxconn factory, factories in China. They're owned by the Taiwanese. The, for the longest time, the most high-tech factories in China were actually run by the Taiwanese. And it gets confusing for a lot of people, and they just go, ah, China, but it's it's a very complicated thing. So the president of Taiwan was, you know, staying at the hotel, and so there was across the street, I'd wake up every morning from, like, Chinese martial music playing, and there was, like, hundreds of people out there holding up pro-China signs and stuff, Chinese people, you know, doing this. And, you know, to sort of say, one, China, we're one, to say, no, we're really one, we're really one. And you're like, who... I, it annoyed annoyed me, you know, because I'm being woken up by this. And you're like, what is the point of this? And it's it was sponsored by the Chinese government. Yeah, it's sponsored by the Chinese government. They're the ones that get you know get the people to get the permits, get them to be able to you know to go do this sort of thing. Um, and it was just sort of this, you know, I, I frankly I found it annoying, but also just to show you the reach that that Chinese government had was, you know, they could get you know number of their 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 citizens living in the U.S. to show up to go make a political statement against this guy. Uh, by the way, this was a story that just popped uh, either today or yesterday that uh, Taiwan has offered political asylum to the Hong Kong protesters, and that has uh, angered China. I yeah. that's a brilliant move on Taiwan's part because I uh, there has to be if I'm living in Hong Kong, like let's say I'm obviously in agreement with the protesters or whatever. Also, like. Uh, hey, this this uh, this uh, this crazy summer that we're having of protesting can't go on forever, and winter's coming. And wouldn't it be great if I wasn't there for a war, <laughs> or when the tanks I mean, show up? <laughs> to, be, to be totally honest, and I know we've been kind of goofing around a little bit about this, but like I, I am deeply fearful of the moment that like oh Taiwanese or Hong Kong internet just shut down. And uh, then, yeah. And then we just, you know, by the time that the lights come back on, everybody's on the same page. And many of you are missing. We, we lost a generation of people in Tiananmen. You know, there are there. Are, we don't know the story. We don't know the full story. You know, with thousands of people that went, you know, gone and, and some and, and, and it per permanently changed the fabric of that society in a way that I don't think was helpful. God, I, I and, really I really perceive. I mean, even thinking of, of what a displacement it would be. Uh, I would I think I would grab my entire family and just just get to Taiwan the moment that offer happens. It's it seems like now's a really good time to uh, you know, uh, to, to sell boat passage. <laughs> you have you have things that happen that, that that you know when you get you when you have any kind of protest movement, you, regardless of how you necessarily feel about their ideologies, these are very passionate, often very intelligent people who do this are people who are part of some sort of movement. And in other regards, like you think of what we lost with the AIDS epidemic, you know, the artists and the creatives and, 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 and amazing people, you know, in in China, at the Tiananmen, you had a bunch of people who were some were reformers, some were other people who were wanting change, whatever, not necessarily not all of them were wanting super liberalized Western style, but wanted changes and things like this. And then gone, gone. How, how many you know? how many people were lost in Tiananmen Square and so on? Sorry. Nobody knows. <laughs> no Nobody way to knows. tell. Yeah, you, you don't. We don't know how many. You don't know how many were. You know, were told. You know that now there's a file on you that you know this and that, and we don't know. And it, and it, you know, it could have been. Just, you know, the we know a number were killed, but a number were re-educated whatever but that was just it's and, then, and, then, and then there's no way much like the chernobyl disaster that that we kick things off with there's no way to know the exact number of people who got cancer because of chernobyl likewise there's not any way to know how many people quietly were whispered and told that they were in the hangman's noose and all they had to do was utter one word and they would quietly you know die yeah you know here we see a headline that says the death toll is ten thousand. like you know we don't know Remember the the one guy that stood in front of the tanks? Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. iconic photo. There's rumors of what happened to him, but we don't know. 
you I know, mean, it's still it's not acknowledged by yeah. Beijing. Like that's yeah. it just that what what anniversary? What are you talking about? Happened? Yeah. There's uh, literally no uh, acknowledgement at all. Uh, which is like, dude. I saw some people on Twitter the other day or online that were like, oh, look at all these Chinese actors and actresses and uh, uh, hip hop artists that are all like tweeting uh, solidarity with the with the Hong Kong police. And it's like, yeah, uh, look at all those uh, uh, people's families that are going to be able to sleep calmly tonight and not have to be moved or reeducated or or worse. Like that is not the same society. We are not I looking. Well, sure, except for the ones that are Chinese Americans that were doing that, which you free you fine, get involved in it. But once if you're not from there and you're here and you're doing this, if you're under that threat, that's fine. But uh, you know, I don't. That's the thing that was sort of is like people who are stepping into it and maybe didn't need who are stepping into it and getting the repercussions from it because it's like, uh, I don't know, you know. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't know. I don't know what. But that was, I mean, most, the, the stuff that I was reading about was all people that were like based in China. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah well, the most thought prominent one I read wasn't. And that was the thing okay. that was like, you know. But yeah, you're right. I mean, if you're from there, like, yeah, like, <laughs> you know, like, you know, we talked about uh, uh, was the actress um, uh, X-Men uh, went vanished. Oh yeah, the one that just went missing. Yeah. Yeah, and then like ended up like married to some Chinese party high party member. Wait, um, uh, sorry, who who's this? I, I I know nothing about this. Fan Bing Bing. Yeah, Fan Bing. Yeah. So she was uh, an actress on an X Men movie, and then and then just dropped off the grid, and and now it turns out it she's happily married, Brian. Uh, yeah, Fan <laughs> Bing Bing. She got in trouble for some tax thing or something, whatever, and literally vanished. And then kind of reappeared a while later and, and you know, uh, she apologized and then she ended up like married off to some high Chinese party official. And uh, But she was gone for, for three months. We I know we covered it extensively yeah. on the show, but yeah. uh, she just disappeared yeah. and then came back and, and paid the government 127 million U.S. dollars. So. Hmm. Yeah, one of the high I mean, one of the most famous actresses in the world. I mean, you know, here she's, you know. Wasn't as recognized, but around the world, and that uh, it's scary. I mean, that also they they disappeared the head of Interpol. Oh yeah, yeah. It's always that, you know. Yeah. International law enforcement agency Interpol. You know, the yeah. head of it just disappears, yeah. and you know, boy, was there a, a lot of oh wait, no headline. No, no, nobody said anything. Just like just kind of a thing where the head of Interpol just. Suddenly God. Look at that. So, uh, hey, uh, <laughs> you know what won't disappear? Such weird things. Yeah, man, yeah. look, uh, unrelatedly, we'd like to buy insurance to make sure that none of us get disappeared. <laughs> if you would like to help us fund our insurance <laughs> for protection, then head on over to patreon.com slash weird things. We're going to buy, you're going to get those dog chips implanted in us. <laughs> oh, those don't have GPS, but we get GPS chips. But we literally get the dog chips put in ours. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly how we would do it. Name We're Andrew, like, uh, we species all got human. <laughs> it was an idea that I had for a bit somewhere, but uh, I don't. I forget if I did any research into it, but I wanted us to submit our... Uh, oh, no, Brian, it was after you got Kepler DNA tested. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Was, <laughs> oh, it'd be really funny if we just spit in a tube and sent it into the dog. Well, those, no, Kepler is the dog. Kepler is the dog. I actually have had his Kepler dog. DNA tested, but that would be cool, too. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that'd be funny. Anyway, you can help fund such uh, shenanigans by going to patreon.com slash weird things. Uh, not only do you get uh, the satisfaction of making sure that this show is paid for and uh, indeed done every single week, but also you get our after things podcast before anybody else does head on over there right now friends that is patreon.com slash weird things hey um imagine you wake up one day mm -hmm. and you look on your front door and there's an old school tv set just sitting there oh i know exactly what this is mm -hmm. uh i mean first of all that's not that's not too long ago because i i had a I had to build uh, for these uh, NACA conferences. 
uh, a booth, and I found out that they had like old school CRTs for only seventy five dollars at Walmart. Guess who bought eight of them <laughs> and then set everything up to make a crazy display, and then realized those things are heavy as hell <laughs> and couldn't get uh, rid of them geez. fast enough. Uh, so you wait. Yeah, you wake up one day, there's a TV on your doorstep. You go to your neighbor, and you go to knock on their door, and they open up the door, and there's a TV sitting there. They're like, what's the deal? I, I don't know. I got this TV. And somebody else is like, I got a TV, too. And so I'm like, but I got a Nest Cam. Everybody, let's gather and watch. Let's see what happened last night. Do, do you know about Motion- this story, Justin? I do not know about okay, this story. Okay, at this so- point, what do you – okay, so essentially a whole neighborhood wakes up. And the TV fairy has showed up and given everyone an old school CRT. Uh, they all gather around. They play this Nest video. What do you think? What Describe to the best of your imagination what, do you what think they happens? see. Yeah. So I would assume, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume that this is wrong because I don't know how exciting of a visual this would be, but... Uh, I would I would guess it is some kind of performance arty sort of thing. So I would just suspect some uh, uh, you know hoodie pulled up, uh, maybe bandana around the face, uh, a person that's just dropping off these TVs because they wanted to be a fun commentary on society. I like where your head's at, but I need you. To, uh, uh, we need something that's gonna pop, that's gonna make the people talk. Come on, dude. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw. There was one name that came to me, and I'm gonna say Justin. Imagine Rudy Kobe decided to do this. Yes. <laughs> Imagine that that he was the one behind it. And now what does it look like? I mean, uh, so it would. All right. So I'm going to assume more than two legs. Uh, <laughs> you know, lab coat and it's, you know, a, 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 j- just the legs of an Android are pushing the cart with all the different uh, all the different televisions on it. Could that's that's a, it's as probably as valid as what happened. Do we have video of this price? Yeah, we do. Here it is. Uh, describe for everybody. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> the man with a CRT <laughs> helmet that is bringing CRT televisions to everybody's doorstep. He looks that like the world's worst crazy. Daft Punk guy. <laughs> He looks like those that, bad guys from Saga, the <laughs> the comic like, book. I, like the resident's biggest fan or something. <laughs> yes. No. Oh, my God. That's so good. <laughs> so and it's no, a guy it, with a TV for a head. We don't know. He's wearing, like, this utility, like, workman suit. <laughs> he's got a TV on his head. We don't yeah, know. So he's got work work boots. Think of, yeah, like like the Maytag man. He's got, like, an untucked <laughs> Maytag man kind of outfit on. He found and something then to this, do. The, the television for a head. But that's... No, it, it is just just amazing. Just fantastic. It, it, so what's happening clearly has to be the performance art result this person was hoping for. Like some number of these houses has to have one of those doorbell Great. cameras. Yeah. I won't know which ones, but I know if I deliver two dozen TVs <laughs> as the mysterious TV fairy, then, uh, then definitely it's got to show up somewhere. Do you, do you know how many he left? I want to say like three dozen or something. They over fifty. Over, over 50. fifty. Oh my god, dude, all, that's 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 all in work. One night art art is art is pain. Uh, it's it's beautiful. This is the world I want to live in. Like um, you do. Hey, you do. Well, was, uh, good point. <laughs> <laughs> we live in the best timeline. Wow. I I remember I remember <laughs> when I was a Sorry. kid. And before the internet, and this is going to be hard for some people to even wrap their minds around, but before the internet, um, if you were 12, you just wanted to sneak out and toilet paper a house because it was better than sitting around. And and I remember explaining to my mom, like, look, it's not the, the vandalism that I want to go do. Like, it's the sneaking out that I want to go do. <laughs> and it's like, what if I just tie a bunch of ribbons everywhere? I was trying to think of, like, pro-social things to do. And then later, of course... Uh, at the age of nearly 40, we were doing the same thing with our compliment bombs, Justin, on Night Attack and NSFW show. Uh, and this feels like a compliment bomb. It feels like the fantasy in real life that we wanted is is sneaking up and giving a gift. What we used to do in high school was we had the same thing. We like to sneak attack and do stuff is we would do we made our own flags. We'd find empty flagpoles. Oh, and, and just yeah. run up oh, random and flags. Run it, and run it up the flagpole. Yeah, yeah. We, did, we did that to our high school one night. We go drive up, we pull up to our high school, we're raising our flag, and we see these two cars come to a screeching halt, and cops come running out. 
<laughs> and the guys a- un, like un, un, ununiformed, like they were like, but they had guns. They're like, what are you freeze, freeze? They're like, what are you doing? And we have this flag with all of our little symbols on it, and we're like. It's a thing we do. We just make our flags and we put it up the flagpoles, empty flagpoles. They look at it and they go, huh, that's kind of cool. (laughs) (laughs) Carry on. And they left us (laughs) because they realized, because they're like, they're thinking, are they running into dirt bags? And they see we're just goofy kids and we show them the flag and we explain the thing and they're like, Oh, that's cool. You know, they're like, that was like, that's this cool. Is, this is classic all-American hijinks. Uh, uh, go on, good sirs. But, you know. I saw American Graffiti. So apparently this happened last year with like 20 TVs, and then this year they finally got on camera, and they think maybe there's multiple TV mans. I mean, TV at this man- point, it's got to be. Like, I love this idea. That, where, that Where is this, by the way? This, this is the end of uh, V for Vendetta, where we're all TV man. <laughs> And we're yeah. all gonna give each other TVs. Like, uh, I think uh, Andrew, you got you got run over by the the, the Skype hole. Where was it? Henrico County, Virginia. Henrico near near Richmond, close enough to Florida how, how, for my uh, Bryce. You are you are a resident weird things Virginia expert. How right. how rich of an area is this? Uh, that's it's a pretty well to do area. It's near the capital. Um, it's kind of the suburb area of 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 Richmond, okay. more or less. Yeah. So this is like all right. This is. I, a good clean fun. Yeah, this is I mean I, I would say no matter where it was, I think the 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 the, the understanding would be that this is good clean fun. Mm-hmm. Uh whether or not it would be received as good clean fun. <laughs> Do you understand the environmental impact of CRT tubes if they're not properly disposed of in the <laughs> I'm gonna be honest with you. <laughs> I mean, it is basically just giving somebody a job of lifting a box of plastic and putting it in the trash. Right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, you could you could say that somebody literally distributed one ton of garbage <laughs> on yeah. everybody's doorstep. Although I think I would suspect that that's probably what they're going for, right? Like they're going for the idea of like, oh, look at this modern marvel that now I'm like delivering like a paper man, but is also garbage wait a minute I, do, do you think this is a way to obfuscate the 500 hundred dollar fine for 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 dumping illegal dumping like like I mean, hey. there are easier ways to get around that brian i mean because basically well, doing you know leaving on property and is the fine probably heavier for what they did so this is like i mean if you caught tv man right <laughs> Like, are you turning them over to the cops or do you just let them go becoming a TV? I want to know where I sign up. <laughs> Here's the nice thing about TV man is unlike Sasquatch, uh, you don't risk being shot on site. <laughs> like, uh, well, have you seen Elvis put on Elvis's door? OK, Bryce, uh, I'm going to send you Elvis on a hunt. See if you can find man. this. Uh, there's a video of somebody walking up to what looks like a very ill bear. And it turns out to be a guy in a bear suit. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's it's pretty remarkable because the dude is apparently alive. <laughs> like, it seems like a really fun prank. But there's something about the brief moment of believing this is an ill grizzly or brown bear. And it looks like it's coming at you that I would imagine uh, that's some high, high wire uh, daredevil stuff. So uh, imagine, I'd like to imagine like there is some guy sitting in a basement in Virginia, you know, with this freaking crazy person, news clippings and stuff there. And he built himself like a spinning wheel and it's the dismemberist, you know, the, the, you know, you know, the, the crowbar killer. And then he put TV on the spinning wheel and he's spun it. And he's like, let's see what I'm going to do. TV. Huh. All right. I can work with this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, it, but school part is like, there's somebody sitting there laughing at everybody, laughing at us, you know, laughing at everybody. Because... I'd like to think he's laughing with us. We're all in on this one. This was, this was a, a delightful prank of merriment. No, he's wa- sitting there with the TV on his head watching this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, man, what? That's great. That uh, is great. What, are we gonna get a bunch of copycats? What are the copycat versions? Or are we gonna get old timey radio guy? It's gonna be a uh, 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 Sirius XM radios. 
<laughs> that he's just distributing. It's just old car unit. He's dressed. Uh, then we get corporate sponsorship where it's like he's sponsored by Spotify. So it says <laughs> Spotify on his shirt as he say, <laughs> gives everybody old, outdated crap. Uh, in, in, in 30 years, it'll be all, everybody's old Casper mattresses and me undies. We'll just, you know, <laughs> purple everybody's mattresses. Dressed. I mean, you can be artistic. You can be doing jack o' lanterns and stuff. Yeah, you could. Uh, Although that would, I think people, people would kind of be happy about that. Oh, I know what I'm going to be. What? I'm going to be Amazon box guy because those things just keep piling up on me. Oh yeah. Oh man. On my head, and take all my extra Amazon, and people will be like, "Oh yeah, I got Amazon," and it's, it's an empty box. We're like, ah, got you like, get it. It, it. Got to take the label off. Oh my God! If you filled a bunch of boxes, a bunch of Amazon boxes, you got like Amazon looking tape, right, to like uh, package it all up, and you just left it, and then people were opening unsolicited Amazon boxes. Number one, I just realized in saying this that now there might be like a scare that it would be like a bomb or something like that. But like, if you opened it and it was just like I don't know, gummy worms in one of them and five dollars in the other one, but just like kind of like like a, like like Cards Against Humanity's like random stuff giveaway thing like like that level of like just nonsense uh on people's doorsteps like that would be a funny art thing uh i see you in the chat suggests uh home phones that's pretty good yeah. oh dude give me one of them uh with the that are like that was clear and had all like the colorful like circuitry inside of the, it like like a swatch phone <laughs> yeah <laughs> never that's swatched in phones about. that's amazing yeah, that, that see-through hammer phone, for me. hell yeah hell yeah <laughs> Uh, so, uh, let's go, uh, jump back over to some SpaceX coverage. So Elon Musk and the SpaceX crew are planning, hopefully soon, pending FAA approval to do a test of the Starhopper. The Starhopper is the test platform for their, the new, uh, the brand new Raptor engines, which is the test bed to lead to the Starship. But there's some new photos that just came out today. If you go over to the Reddit for uh, SpaceX, uh, SpaceX or Reddit or SpaceX, you can see some photos of cylinders and things coming together because they're also working on building the Starship at the same time as the Hopper. Again, the Hopper is the test thing. Starship is the actual thing itself. And it's kind of a sight to behold to see, well, you know, a giant version of this made of stainless steel are you know being erected out there in this case out there i think the photos that came out today are in florida so, uh that's awesome uh, there was a yeah. a bit of uh, bryce we have photos of those? i have no idea how to find anything i can never find anything on the spacex reddit do you know what thread it oh, might be it's in? one of the top links so i'm sorry i can find it for you right now uh, if you don't mind i just i don't yeah yeah, yeah yeah uh in the meantime uh there's a bunch of eye rolling in the press because uh I guess uh, uh, Elon announced that he wanted to sell nuke Mars T-shirts and was, you know, reminding people of that idea that you could nuke uh, Mars and all of that sort of like, oh, here we go again. Like, I'm trying to think of like, who's against that idea? Like, uh, why? Why the eye rolling? Why? Why is there a general lack of excitement for this clearly good uh, idea if what you want to do is make Mars a habitable place. What what is the what would the benefit again? Because I think maybe that's where it comes from is they just don't know what nuking Mars would do for the planet. Yeah. So, than... well, uh, so what it would do is uh, if you if you melt all the water in the ice caps, uh, uh, you're you're also melting all of the uh, dry ice, mm -hmm. and so that releases just a ton of sublimated CO two, which uh, of course is a greenhouse gas. So you get a thicker atmosphere, you get increased atmospheric press pressure, you get um, uh, uh, more trapping of warmth on there. And theoretically, if you throw enough nukes at it, you can have a a, a good sized atmosphere and uh, and and start warming the place up. Uh, the the downside is it has the word nuke in it. <laughs> Well, all right. Well, so I mean, well, you, you just you just identified it. Uh, uh, so number one, bring in all preconceived notion to not only nuclear energy, right, which we have our own hangups on, but nuclear weapons, right? Like a, a nuclear missile uh, uh, is something that people think they have a lot of uh, baggage about, and then also tie the like a little bit of the the uh, the whiteies on the moon uh, element of like, okay, this is what we're talking about. Well, I, I would. 
I'll give you the counter argument. That the scientific one is that there there's nowhere near enough CO2 or water vapor there that if you nuke it to really noticeably change the atmosphere to create the atmosphere and to do that. That's one argument's made. There have been papers that have said that. Have said that listen, you can melt all of it and it's still not gonna have the effect that you want to. That's one scientific argument against it. Um, I'm gonna be very clear, I'm pro nuke, I'm gonna buy the shirt. The second <laughs> argument is is the idea that should we change Mars? Should we change it? You know, should we change this environment? Um, and in the, you know, it's sort of, you know, like because the, the idea, it's all theoretical until we go there and we look and see what's there. So if we're like, oh, we, do we destroy what's life there? We're like, we won't do it until we know. But even if there's no life on Mars, do we want to change the structure of this thing? You know, this is, you know, you could put some amazing condominiums in the Grand Canyon. I would love to live there personally. But, you know, other people are like, no, don't put condos in the middle of the Grand Canyon. And, uh, yeah, uh, choice, th so. this is a really, really heated debate in Kim Stanley Robinson's Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars trilogy, where uh, there are uh, uh, the Reds are the ones uh, who are geologists mainly who say there is an unprecedented amount of geological uh, valuable data by this untouched, pristine, alien, dead place. Uh, uh, don't you dare try to change a thing. And then the the Greens that are like, uh, no, this is territory. We're going to expand to it. And we can't can't do anything with it the way it is right now. <laughs> so let's let's get to work changing it. Uh, and uh, I don't know. It seems to me like there's a lot of rocks of all different types throughout our solar system. And uh, I'd rather this one be wet and green. <laughs> And, and, and if uh, nuking it is, is how we get there, so be it. Is, is there a concern of radiation? I mean, it's, I, it's uh, already uh, an irradiated wasteland. Uh, they have no, there's no, uh, there's no magnetosphere to block any of the solar ra radiation. It's uh, and, yeah, the, the fallout bright. It would be sh very short lived comparatively so to the amount of time that it would take because you're okay. you're talking something that's a centuries long process. Sure. So if you're using, you know, radio, you know, uh, nuclear sources that have very short half lives comparatively, so you're you're not gonna, it's not gonna be a problem. I just think I, I that I, it's, it's a it's a catchy slogan, but I think it it <laughs> it doesn't do a service to the subtleties of, of actually explaining the method. You know, it should they should have a second shirt that says nuke Mars. And then under it says, no, it's actually good. It'll terraform it, and it won't have radiation <laughs> yeah. left over. And we don't worry. And it, and it goes on to say, don't worry about the fallout friend. because it's already an irradiated wasteland, and all we're doing is increasing the chances that it becomes habitable. Yeah. Something and then like the, the, back, the back of the Mars T-shirt. Yeah, the back of the shirt is just the hundred most frequently asked questions <laughs> written in like twelve point font, <laughs> and so you can just like, oh no, 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 you're thinking of a number sixty-one. <laughs> Take about a third yeah. vertebrae, and it just just <laughs> well, to just to throw it in there. Also, uh, uh, an encryption algorithm for for hard encryption that'll be illegal to travel across state borders. Yeah, just put the DVD the DVD mask there you go. Code yeah, on the back of it. <laughs> just, to, just, just put a QR <laughs> code for all of that. Here's 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 the thing, too, Bryce. Uh, if you got that photo, that we yeah. show that. Like, here's the thing, because like you'll get periodic like scientists find out. You know, colonizing Mars, not as easy as Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk think. Like, one, we don't know what they think. Two, yeah, it's a hard problem that we don't have all the answers to. And that's part of the reason they've put these hard problems out there of, like, you know, for Bezos colonizing space and whatnot. And, and Elon Musk, Mars is like, hey, let's have the, let's do a thing we don't have all the answers for. You know, let's not decide right now it can't be done. Let's find out if it can't be done because um, hmm. it's the whole point. And yeah, that is part of the, the, their like entrepreneurial mindset, right? I mean, how many things have they started that made them their legacies? That based on the idea that they were pretty sure they knew the direction of where to go to the solution, and they worked until they got it. Go back to the the photo, Bryce. Take a look at this, guys. Yep, that's wow. that's the scale. So what you're looking at there is uh, super friggin' huge. You know, where you look, you see the warehouse next to it. That's the they're in their building and still like in cylinders they're attached stacking one on top of the other. You can see to the left, you see the dome that's gonna go on the front of the uh starship, which is gonna be that. And then they're gonna be building the booster, and this whole thing is gonna be we'll finish thing will be taller than the Saturn V. Jesus Christ. That's amazing. Yeah. And uh there's this giant dome-shaped tent where they're gonna be doing this assembly of it, which 
you know, there's no door on it. I guess kind of when they're ready to take it out, they'll just pull that thing apart. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is crazy. And you can see a bunches of other cylinders stacked up in the in the foreground there. Uh, it, absolutely insane. It's like something out of a Robert Heinlein novel. Uh, is, this, is, is, is this an official SpaceX photo or is this a random drone person? I don't know. I think this is a random. This is credited person. to Seymour Holdings, LLC. Yeah. So I'm going to guess that's not. It SpaceX. is. It's a very pretty photo. Though. It is. Kind of, yeah. I mean, it just. It does. It, it actually looks an awful lot like uh, the scene where they're digging out the monolith in 2001. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, so, so let's yeah. do it. Let's put Exploder 1 on that and just send it on out to Mars. Oh, uh, also in the news, I saw that uh, that Starman has made his first lap around the sun in, a, in yeah. the Tesla. That's pretty dope. <laughs> <laughs> that so photo amazing. was amazing. <laughs> it really was, dude. That was that was money in the bank slash rage in the bank. Like, it's it's yeah. it's perfect. because You want to talk about Whitey on the moon. That, that whole thing got some people fired up all right let's get fired up for some picks yeah hey i got a show that none of you have heard of uh what we do in the shadows oh! on FX. <laughs> had uh had you seen any of them i've seen none of them i've now seen four of them it's really funny uh, <laughs> uh look uh, obviously love the documentary. Uh, there's definitely, it's hard to step in considering the, the kind of like talent that they had on that show that have all obviously gone on to do uh, uh, bigger, more uh, uh, high profile things. And none of them are returning, at least as of the episodes that I saw, anybody from the original series has made their way to the show, but or the original documentary mockumentary. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, really funny and clever and it, it retains a lot of that subversive uh uh fish out of water our, our characters are like good-hearted but also literal evil monsters <laughs> uh uh i believe it's episode six there's a thing that's awesome i'm very excited to hear from you after episode six okay anybody else uh i'm reading the three body problem it's a translation from its best-selling book uh, in China, and it begins with uh, some vignettes uh, that 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 I'm sure culturally resonate uh, to uh, the Chinese uh, as you know obvious, but to me were kind of fascinating. The idea that uh, it's problematic when science disagrees with the dogma of uh, during the Cultural Revolution, and uh, then things are ramping up to suggest that maybe the world is uh, the universe is a little bit broken or or not what we think it is and there's some fundamental misunderstanding so i'm only i'm only maybe a, a quarter of the way into it um uh i'm, I'm digging it it sounds like you were less of a fan did, did you finish it I, no I'm, I'm probably maybe just a little bit further on or maybe a little more than you are in it um let me get it just check get a little time reader i i i think it is it is Harder than I would expect, because I'm sure these are all very common names in Chinese, but but they all are esoteric enough to my Western sensibilities that it's a little bit tough for me to keep track of, oh, this is a different person. Now oh, and you're not reading it, so you actually can't see how it's spelled, Correct. which actually, oh, man, yeah. interesting. Yeah. I'm halfway into it. I think I think that the narrator thinks does a pretty good job of trying to do different voices for people. I'm halfway into it, and I think the writing is excellent. I think the science stuff is... I'm, you know, I write, obviously, as a guy who writes a scientific character, I'm very sensitive when I read other people writing about science to when I think somebody's doing a really good job or when somebody's faking it. And and it just feels, you know, you're like, no, you said that because it's cool, but it's not really a thing. And now this book feels dumb to me. You know, I have that problem with stuff where it's like you could have done something, you know, they want to try to make it sound more clever than it is and they kind of fail because they don't know it. And I read this is great because I think that I think his the science writing is great. The references are great. The examples are great. He uses exact, you know, analogies. And Brian brought up a great one about like this, this pool table set, setting there. And it's a great way to illustrate, you know, you know, the, the concerns of when you're doing observational, you know, on theoretical physics and things like this. So really good in that regard. For me, it's just the pacing is just sort of a thing where like 
I'm halfway into it, and I'm going to keep going because everybody raves about it. So I'm not going to you know prejudge it, but it, it, to me, it's sort of this kind of it's like all right, all right, all right. I, I want you to I want you to you know I want you to be there already, but it's it's a very beloved book, and I my friends who've read it absolutely absolutely consider it one of their favorites, and I think the writing in it the writing itself is fantastic. I do like uh, the choice from the narrator, uh, who I believe is Luke Daniels, um, and. They want to convey that there's a cop that doesn't have time for your high-minded intellectual nonsense. So they give him kind of a Brooklyn or Bronx accent, where which is is funny knowing that all of this is taking place in China. So yeah, but you got this cop like, "Hey, what's going on?" <laughs> with with the particular it's, voice. You know what? But it's, it's great because also it's like when you watch like translations of like like Hong Kong as a kid watching Hong Kong movies and stuff. Yeah, they would figure out the yeah, this person's this is when they're from this region. Yeah, it's kind of like being from Brooklyn, or this is kind of like. Do you know the story that they dubbed Arnold Schwarzenegger's accent in Terminator in Germany? Oh, they did? Uh, what? Because Austrian accents there sounded extremely rural. They sounded kind of like a hillbilly. Oh, so, so, so to the them, it was like, like a hey, y'all. Hey, y'all. Oh, hey, I'm the Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, no, no. And, and I do like that. And, and um, I'm a huge fan of... Uh, we, we see it in, I'm trying to think of uh, specific uh, examples of it, but I love it in science fiction where you want to convey that uh, a certain, you know, alien race is kind of like this. Or or uh, you get it a lot in, in Name of the Wind, when, which we were talking about, where there are different regions. And so you could tell like, oh, you're you're doing kind of a Eastern European thing for, for this cultural uh, 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 oeuvre. And yeah. uh, I, I, I dig all that. I love it in fantasy when it's like, you know, you want to convey that they're cold and evil, you make them British. Or if you want to convey that they're gay, they're British. Or if you want to, <laughs> you know, make sure that they're like they're running a castle, you just make them British. Make them British. Or if you want to write fantasy, you make them yeah. all British. Yeah, that's right. British. Uh, I, 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 again, I want to, and I, I can't, the, the name is, is, uh, Sishin Lee. I, I can't have trouble with that yeah. name because I'm an ignoramus. Um, you know, we mm-hmm. talked about earlier, start of the show about, hey, it's, it's going to Hong Kong and China and whatnot. Um, reading a book from the point of view of from somebody born, you know, raised in China from there, talking about, as Brian pointed out, talking about like, it starts off with the Cultural Revolution, which is a thing that, you know, most of us here in the West are kind of completely ignorant about and what was really going on. And uh, and, and the a, a very honest sort of depiction from what I what I understand of like. Hey, this is how disruptive it was towards intellectuals. This is how really bad it was if you were somebody who was any teacher, an educator in this. And to be able to write it and know that a Chinese writer can feel comfortable writing about that was interesting. But uh, that was a great setting. It was neat because you see it's interesting to read a book from somebody who is from there who's also read Isaac Asimov and Heinlein, who's very yeah. much a citizen of the world, too, which yeah. is cool. I, I also dug the fact that when handed strange conundrums, all of the characters so far seem to react in highly rational scientific ways. Um, uh, I think we're early enough in the book. Uh, uh, is, it, is it fair game to talk about that vignette where the guy was 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 uh, uh, taking pictures and kept seeing? Yeah. OK, so uh, dude, dude snapping photos on uh, his film camera. And uh, when he develops the photos, even though it's archaic and everybody uses digital now, he keeps seeing what looks like a countdown. And uh, and the countdown seems to be consistent. And that's a little bit scary. And so he does it again. And, and y- you get this very scientific breakdown. And then he's like, well, what happens if my wife takes the pictures? What happens if my kid takes the pictures? What happens if I borrow a camera from somebody else? And then at some point, it gets to the point where he's seeing the number of the countdown in his eyes. And so he goes to an ophthalmologist. And, then he, and so he starts to describe. And they're like, oh, you're just overworked. You're tired. And then he starts const- – like it's, it's a very rational – set of okay now let's eliminate this other possibility really again and i i cannot praise how well the writer has done is you is in that his scientific characters behave like scientists right you know not not science fiction book scientists you know or 50s are a sorry you know idea what this they think like scientists, not because they're going to throw a bunch of terms and stuff at you, and therefore I am a scientist, but as Brian is illustrated, it's like, this is how a guy who's got a background in physics 
would try to solve this problem. Right. You know, and, and I really appreciated that. And people who are the theoretical physicists behave kind of like how theoretical physicists are. Whereas the applied for- scientists have a different take. Uh, uh, there was almost this deferential like, what? I'm just an applied scientist. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I'm digging yeah. it so far. Yeah, that that part I love. Pacing's my thing off, but I'm going to keep keep going with it because. All right, we'll check back it in. Is on so, it is so what it is. I've been so disappointed because like I'm like ah, oh, you should read this book. It's the science is great, and I'm like, uh, I'm like it's, I, I, it's, I like I like how much it just takes for granted that you already know and understand. Where yeah. where it's like uh, it, it it doesn't hold your hand uh, with. So far, not a single person has drawn anything on a napkin, which is great. <laughs> I poked a hole through a piece of paper to show us how wormholes work. <laughs> right. uh, um, I have a I have a related pick. Yep. Uh, no. Uh, because you guys are talking about the three body problem, and I actually thought when I watched this, I thought this was going to be the three body problem, but it was it was a short story written by the same by the same author, Liu Cixin. Uh It's a film that came out this year, and it's on Netflix now, The Wandering Earth, uh, mm-hmm. and it's. It's very interesting, and uh, f- from the little bit that I, I saw about the original short story, the film is uh, is a little divergent. Uh, but the movie, uh, I, the movie is very good. It's this big, like apocalyptic sort of uh, crisis movie, where you know they install all these uh, thrusters, these like big, uh, 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 you know, jets onto the Earth itself to move it what? into a oh, new star it's... system. And people so live under the rockets like, because there's, it is it's an ice age. It is far from three body problem in house. <laughs> it is dumb. It is so like it is a pretty dumb action movie. I, I didn't read the short story, and it's hard to reconcile in my head. Mm. I could not make it through the movie because I'm like, if you think really? Armageddon was too intellectual, <laughs> it is. A, it is a yeah. It, it is a, a little dumb though. I, I I bring it up because the things that I've seen is that the short story is leans more into like the societal issues and the actual debate of doing this project and and like it does have more nuance versus this film that made a billion dollars it's, it's the one body problem <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so but this it, was uh uh I, I think i remember you mentioning this bryce like mm-hmm. this just wound up getting dumped on netflix right even though it was like one of the biggest earners in like chinese box office history, history. Yeah. yeah yeah it's huge it's it, it's great and i uh it's I, I was crying by the end of it, and it's <laughs> it's it's, it's Bruce Willis. He loved his his kid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it is it is a dumb action. Like that, that like let's not get it mixed up. This is a dumb action movie, but it's it's a spectacle. Like all the CG. You, one of so part of it is that the surface of the Earth is basically frozen over more or less, mm-hmm. and so there there's uh, 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 one of the acts there like transporting this big engine to go save one of the one of the big rockets, and they're driving through. Um, a flooded and frozen Shanghai or, or like, you know, uh, and so you're just seeing the actual city, but it's, you know, these huge, you know, hundred feet walls of ice and they're like going through the crack. It's, it's, a, it's, it's an incredible spectacle. Uh, and, and for an action movie, it's, it's really fantastic. It's the wandering earth. It's on Netflix now. Right on. It there tur- was, turns out that that it, uh, three body problem is a sequel, and all of a sudden this Earth comes in out of nowhere. Like that's why physics is so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> out of the way, nerds! <laughs> no spoilers. <laughs> My, uh, I, I, wandering Earth, like, like the premise. I'm like, man, like I remember watching Thundar the Barbarian, <laughs> where they had like the episode. Because remember Thundar? Oh yeah, absolutely, dude. That was great. Yeah, so Thundar was this post-apocalyptic story. It was kind of like a He-Man story, but set in the far future of the Earth. And yeah, at some I, point, I, I think like, it was supposed to be a Conan kind of like uh, story. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, your 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 barbarian trope, but like the uh, the, Earth, the Earth's moon's been split in half and whatnot. And they have a uh, uh, there's a scene where they need to. Uh, or there was an episode I think they had to move the Earth and they go find all these rocket engines like you know at one point like in like Antarctica or something like that and they move the Earth. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. That's like Same. that episode of Super Friends where Lex Luthor uh-huh. was like he was setting up all these ways to cause the Justice League of America to have them be the architects of Earth's demise. Like he sent a missile to blow up Earth, but it was yellow, so Green Lantern couldn't stop it, so he moved the Earth instead. Does but Green then... Lantern not touch yellow stuff? Oh yeah, no, he doesn't do yellow. Uh, that's, well, that's his. That's his yeah. thing. And so, <laughs> and so yeah. he moved by moving. The, Why are you right? laughing, Bryce? Yeah, by, this is very serious. This <laughs> is my childhood. But by moving I, the I, earth, I'm laughing at my childhood. 
<laughs> and by moving the earth nice. <laughs> by moving the earth to a different orbit it changes the climate and so uh, there was vines everywhere or like the futurama where they do the same thing where yeah they, they push the earth into a farther orbit to stop global warming uh i mean first of all i i don't see why that can't work we could do that we just need to make a lot of robots that far gas it's only an engineering problem at this point <laughs> did you have a pick, uh, my pick is let me get my notes here um so i watched this movie and like I watched it again to sort of analyze this thing going on like like years later because it's a franchise that they're talking about bringing back yet again. Uh, it is a beautiful, 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 beautiful movie with a plot that you go like, man, this is really... I wish the writers had more opportunity and time to sort of really build out the story. And this is Tron Legacy. Oh, Yeah. Uh, that movie, that movie was a good half of a movie spread into the length of a full movie. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a problem with like a lot of it because the protagonist doesn't do anything, you know, and, and, you know, that doesn't really, you need to go here. Well, I'll go there and I'll get there. Hey, we got there. Our movie's over. Do, 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 do. There was definitely you know, this... like, like, wow, like what's the plot? You're <laughs> kind of like, there's a story, but there's not a real plot in my, my feeling towards it, but I don't want to be too harsh on it because, Again, it's you know when you're doing a project for Disney and you've got to bring back this IP and you've got the who who knows how many iterations go through because damn if it's not a gorgeous movie. It is gorgeous and the music is great, but there was definitely Daft Punk. It's Daft Punk does that soundtrack and that's a good okay. soundtrack. And uh, uh, they cameo like seven times Wait, just what? in case. <laughs> like like <laughs> I didn't know hey that. man, that's we're still here. Not. Whoa, yeah. that's crazy. <laughs> what are we doing in this nightclub? <laughs> also, oh, Daft. Well, Punk's here. Also, you know, and I, I remember going into it, Body saying like, oh yeah, there's a whole set piece about a party. And like, wow, man, I wonder what a party in Tron world's going to look like. Turns out, a shitty kegger. <laughs> That's what it looks like. Yeah, you you realize that like, there is this, it's one of these kids, there's, because I, I watched it like, and, and the next night I watched Blade Runner 2049, which is another a gorgeous movie, a better plot, but still you're like, Harrison Ford becomes like he's the Maltese Falcon, you know, the the his yeah. the Decker characters basically we got to find the thing, they're going to steal the thing, we're going to move the thing to here and you realize he has very little agency in it when he finally comes introduced to it, but it's such a gorgeous movie, but I'm like in Tron I'm like tell me more about the backstory of where these ISO things came from and about Flynn building this place. Like that's the story I want to get. And then the, the revolution that happened, that was the interesting part And Blade Runner 2049. I'm like, you think you watch that movie again in the Wallace character, Jer Jared Leto's character. You're like, okay, let me get this straight. This guy, he's so rich. He builds, he has this big, the Wallace corporation has this monolith, monolith building in LA. That's even friggin' bigger than the Tyrell Corporation building, but he really lives off world on some other planet because he's got millions of replicants that he's colonizing the galaxy with. I'm like, I want to follow that guy. <laughs> you know, yeah. I want to go, I want to go, I want to go off world. I want to go follow that story. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But, you know, um, whatever happened to Gosling's girlfriend, you know. <laughs> Oh, uh, so we got to figure it out. Yeah. Oh, but but I mean, I I loved. I mean that that story. No, I really I really dug it. I I, I dug twenty forty nine. No, I yeah I let me clear. I love twenty forty nine too, and I, I loved the best part for me was like the relationship with Kay and the Joy character, the digital that like what's it you know two two artificial beings and their love, loved that. But and I would say that like, but I was going like man, the thing I kind of I want to I'd love to spend more time here wasn't didn't bother me, but like in Tron was like really like. Man, like there's a really interesting story here, but yeah, I think yeah, that was the problem. And also, uh, if we're gonna, Garrett Hedlund is not Ryan Gosling. Also, how great would it have been in Tron if, like, you know, at the end of Act Two, they really needed help and they found a uh, down on his luck uh, Sark, like you know, like, hey man, we need <laughs> you. <laughs> You're the only one who knows how this program thinks. And then and David Warner, you know, digital David Warner was in it. That would be amazing. That'd be great. Yeah, I went and watched the back to back. I went and watched Tron. In in in, in it's a trippy, weird, strange movie, but it's still cool because that reality of it is is so. 
I, 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 I remember revisiting it. the original Tron in my 20s, and I loved it deeply as a kid, but realized that tr the original Tron is one of the best movies to just have on with the, no audio in the background yeah. and one of the worst movies to give your full attention to. And, uh, and, and maybe Legacy sought to follow in those same <laughs> footsteps. Yeah, I'll, what I'll say about the original Tron is that, like, uh, yeah, I kind of recommend watch it and go, wow, this is really weirder than I remember. And then go watch it again, knowing, oh, yeah. And then you're like, and there, but th th there was a clearer story there. There was a clearer objective. You know, we knew, you know, Flynn's goal, whatever, everything they sort of did to serve that were legacy. It's like, I'm going to skydive off the income building. Turns out I own it. I'm like, uh, I don't... there was definitely a full uh, Campbellian circle with the original Tron. You know, you got you got somebody who's washout loser who's given up. Like, yeah, what, what does it matter? You can't make a difference in this world. That's why I run an arcade. And then he's transported into a strange world, and we see a bunch of wacky stuff. He makes friends along the way, meets a wizard, and then uh, and then realizes, oh my God, there is things worth fighting for, and comes back with the uh, you know all the money on the planet. Uh, that's 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 a real story, and you're right. That was definitely lacking in Legacy. Yeah, I like that. the Wizard of Oz was an influence because like that he goes into the Tron world and friends of his are there. That's right. Because... That, oh, that's right. Yeah, the the, the the programmer folk. Yeah, the the the, the programs they made look like their creators, and and I was funny because like I, I watched after Legacy, I was like, I think Wreck It Ralph makes more logical sense than this does. Yeah. To like where the characters came from, what their reality is to their world, the consistencies and stuff. So, yeah. But anyhow, <laughs> no end on that note. Um, uh, it's been weird. Hey, there we go. All right. Anybody need to break? Uh, yeah. I, I don't okay. know if Bonnie's back. I got to make sure. That... Sure. So, do you want some? Uh, I'm okay. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm going to start after things here in just a minute. Hello, hello. Uh, yeah, if you need a break, go take it. Now I want to watch Blade Runner again. Blade Runner 2049. Um, yeah, I actually do. I, I owe that one another uh, another run. I actually watched it with Andrew and uh, Roshni. No. Oh. First came out in L.A., but that was into the back stuff and uh, we were at one of those great theaters where um, you can like relax like you can like go Recline. but like the, 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 the seats were very soft which at that at any other moment in existence would have been great at that particular moment a a an ability to constantly fiddle with my chair and the the super soft backing was just like uh i wound up like leaving just to go walk around like two or three times but also yeah. it's like a 17 hour movie so i don't feel like i i missed all that much yeah the um the uh, one of the alamos uh out here just got the recliner seats the like the electronic recliner seats and so yeah. um they're they're good, but they have because they have the they have the tables and you order food right and and so they have a yeah. little light under the table and so when you bring your feet up you can see your legs. Your legs are like illuminated because of the light, which is uh oh. And is just, that a little weird? It's a little it's like, distracting because I'm like, are other people seeing my legs? It's like, man, like you're trying to watch a movie and then you just like look down. And you're like, damn, I got sexy legs. And it's like, <laughs> you know, maybe that's kinda, why I didn't like Fast and the Furious. So much. Yeah, I I love the so like I when we go see a movie, we go to the AMC mm -hmm. here, and I only I try to just only go to ones with uh where we have like the, re the recliner seats yeah you know we have my favorite seats i choose and so we got that movie pass i'm just looking like they have free wi-fi now at amc that's what the thing the app says like that we don't need wi-fi in a movie theater <laughs> no that would no. It, it that was like what's it called uh, uh uh when they would do those like hey don't text but also text your number in to this yeah. number mm -hmm. it's like all right, we're they, at crop purposes here. Like then, then they made an app. Uh, some of the places have an app where it's like, uh, use our app and we'll turn your phone off for the duration of the movie and you'll get points. Cool. I think that was. I think yeah. That was yeah, it's weird. And, weird it's stuff. Like, look, uh, uh, I'm actually for. I know everybody flipped out about it, but like uh, when when one of the 
movie chain CEOs was like flirting with the idea of saying like, hey, we, we might just do fiddle with your phone screenings. Yeah. Like are allowed to talk in text like in these screenings. Oh, wait, like, like baby, like baby day or just have no have a change. It would essentially be what a baby day technically really is, which is a relaxation of the rules that people can be a little louder with the understanding that you're bringing young kids in uh, uh, while parents are watching these movies. But uh, instead, it would literally just be for, like, anybody who behaves poorly in, you know, with the normal rules. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> I wonder if that goes for heckling and shouting, like, don't go in there! <laughs> That'd be great. I'm like, uh, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm for that, like, because I was like, dude, let all the people who are, like, into that, if you're going to buy the specific version of that ticket, then mm. I'm excited that I'm not going to go to the movies with you. Like, well, I, I feel like also, maybe we should just go our separate ways. There are movies that I think I would go see in the theater only if I knew that it was cool for me to play Hearthstone while it was on. Mm. <laughs> like, like uh, you know, just I messing around, that you know? Be, I, yeah, because I like the Alamo, and I... I, I know most of the time I go and see movies by myself, but I would I kind of feel weird at Alamo because I I I like talking to the people with me if I'm with people about the movie. Yeah, I mean, not not very loudly, but just like 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 oh my god, that's a guy from the opening scene. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so like I but Alamo is very much over when you're seeing the movie and you just goes, "This is terrible." <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching this. This sucks. Uh, well. I'm going to light the cigar. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm just going to buy, I'm going to mind my own business with these symbols. <laughs> crash, crash. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, got after things coming up in just a moment here. Yeah. For after things, are we uh, are we just doing the thing that we talked about doing? Yeah, I think so, it, and it could be shorter. Um, and Spoiler we'll, cast of it. Yeah, and we'll see. Uh, to be honest, man, I I don't, I don't really know how to do spoiler in time. I think we just might skip it this week since okay. Tom's out. Sure. Sure, 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 sure. Uh, let me pull up some stuff very briefly so I have something to show. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, did did Tron Tron made an appearance in Tron Legacy, right? In some digital version he, of him. Yeah, yeah, he was Tron. He was the the, the Rinsler. Turned out Rinsler was actually. Oh, yeah. Was Wait, Tron, Tron is a character? Tron's the name of a guy. I thought it was the name of the world. No, okay. it's uh, th that was the confusion. Oh, Bryce, that you're a lot of so Frank oh, Frankenstein was the doctor, yeah. not oh, the monster. You're thinking oh, of Frankenstein's oh, monster. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know all the characters in Ed, Ed and Eddie, though. <laughs> They're in the ah! fucking name of the. Right. Which one's Caillou again? <laughs> wait, no, wait, no. That's the world, right? They go to the world. <laughs> of Ed, Ed, Ed. The Ediverse. <laughs> all right. So, uh, oh, let me do one last thing here. So I have this set up. I uh, wish that they didn't have two different are two names for the thing that we're going to talk about because it makes looking for it kind of difficult. Oh, yeah. Weird. All right. So uh, we'll, we'll be talking about the Amazing Jonathan documentary and after, and after things, it'll be a little bit of a spoiler cast. So too late. I'm t I know it's way too late, but, uh, but Pink Floyd is the band. There's no one person named Pink. <laughs> oh, not Floyd. <laughs> Man, she was oh. great in the '90s, though. <laughs> I love Pink Floyd's later work. You yeah. know, <laughs> she has, she's big in Australia. That's... Yeah, it's great. Alrighty, you guys ready to do after things? Oop, no, not that one. Wait, what? Wasn't that a thing with Marilyn Manson? Like at first, they were they tried to make a whole thing about how Marilyn Manson like Marilyn was uh, the name of. Uh, wasn't it like there was a whole band and they all had different crazy names yeah no it was uh yeah they all had one name glamour icon one name serial killer yeah but then didn't it change where like they 
Uh, Marilyn Manson and the Spooky Kids was what it was originally named. There you go. And then they just like, all right, we'll just be Marilyn Manson. We're all Marilyn Manson. And go. Yeah. yeah. Florida Boys made good. All right. Feeling it. All righty. Uh, let's, oh, no. Andrew needs one second. So, yeah. Uh, we will not. Wow. A lot of former members of Marilyn Manson, Wikipedia is telling me. Uh, JK206, uh, the exact line I was thinking of uh, from, uh, oh, which song is that? It's from Wish You Were Here, uh, Have a Cigar, I, th I think, where they uh, they do this one stint of the kind of kind of shit that record producers say. And uh, they're like, oh, my God, I love your stuff. Amazing. By the way, which one's pink? And <laughs> <laughs> Oh, here we go. Marilyn Manson, Daisy Berkowitz, Olivia Newton Bundy, and Jaja Speck. I recognize one of those last names. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, man. I'm Marilyn Manson. Man. What, a, what a crazy situation, man. I, <laughs> dude, one in a million. <laughs> what, what are you going to do? Wait, 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 sorry, what? I'm just filling time. Oh, okay. I, I thought there was recent news that I was not privy to. Oh, no. no. Oh, got I'm it. just doing You the, see that guy the, got a rib removed? Anyway. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait. That explains his smoke from his crotch constantly. That's right. <laughs> wait, he got a what? Oh, the rib. The oh, rib. yeah, yeah, yeah. The rib thing. Um, I was looking up. Have you guys seen this meme of the woman yelling at the cat? Yes. No. The that's one of the Real Housewives. Yeah. Uh, it's like a meme of just like a yeah, super yeah. overly dramatic like woman like screaming literally I guess on one of the housewife shows and then like. The next picture is what you are assuming she's yelling at, and she's this cat at the dinner table. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite is the mashup of this one and the uh, uh, the what is it the American Motorcycles show or something? Oh yeah, yeah. the, the and, American uh, Choppers. American where, Choppers. Where it's and the they dad swap talking. the faces between them, so it's the little guy here. And <laughs> I saw one today that was just the lady yelling was Daenerys on the dragon, and then it <laughs> cut to. The King's Landing. It was just all little cat heads running away. <laughs> oh, I missed this. What did I miss? Oh, <laughs> mean. <laughs> Please tell me that that that's accurate context for for what that was in the original clip. No, a Real House I didn't yell at a cat. <laughs> I'd love it if they did. <laughs> No, yeah, it's not from the same show. It, it was like stuff like, like, where like, a dude just had. Where's the cat from? Is that also a real house? No, it, it's just an Instagram cat that <laughs> just actually <laughs> threw up. <laughs> okay, we can't just be looking at ebombsworld.com. <laughs> <laughs> but if we did, what should we search for to find this? A woman yelling at cat okay. <laughs> 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 Oh. 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 Uh, hey, we have a shower. You're going to bathe. It's pronounced hour. Oh, I, I was getting sent pics. Bonnie was sending mm -hmm. me pics of the shower at the, uh, at, at the new place. Very exciting. That's right. <sighs> All right, you guys good for after things? Yes. Yes. All right, let's take it away in three, two. Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Oh, hi, friends. Brian Brushwood. Ahoy, ahoy, ahoy. And Bryce, 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 Bryce. Castillo, Castillo, Castillo. Uh, Castillo. Ooh, what's <laughs> me? Hi, is everybody. That, is that a vocoder? What do you got there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, I can turn the echo on. Hi, everybody. Stop. A documentary came out on Hulu, a Hulu-produced documentary, and it, you didn't know if you're watching it, if you forgot that it was produced by Hulu. All you have to do is look in the right corner, and everything on Hulu says friggin' Hulu on it, which is why I can't watch anything on Hulu anymore. I'm okay. I'll be better. <laughs> I'm fine. I, I watched the terror. couldn't watch it because it's a historic piece, but there's Hulu. Every scene, there's Hulu. Um, but I watched this so we could talk about the show. Although my protest against, you know, that icon continues. <laughs> <laughs> He'll stand lonely vigil. He's still there. Hulu hating man. <laughs> Some exactly. say, if you listen to the wind, you'll hear him saying that damn logo. 
as I put on my mask and I aim my laser pointer at the icon on the TV. <laughs> yeah. It's like you walk up and you're like, yeah, we're all protesting the Hulu logo, right? Oh, Listen, we'll, 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 we'll chase him because he can take it. Our lone protector, our Hulu <laughs> it's hater. Like, it's like, like, you know, today at the, this therapy meeting for people who are really upset by this Hulu logo, it's just me <laughs> sitting uh, hey, there Bryce, with 12 quick, could chairs. you put that logo in the corner of, of our podcast? Oh, I was going to do that bit. Yes, I was. <laughs> oh, God. It just, I cannot, like, I remember that was a thing they started doing on, like, network shows, yeah. you know? It was like the, the bug, they call it the bug, and it mm-hmm. became a thing. And then, and then I went to watch a show on Hulu, and I'm like, when's that going to go away? I don't know, it's... I was trying to watch the terror. I'm like, no, nah, it's still there. Yeah, it's it's still there. Ah, it's there. Ah, I can't well, watch this. But Andrew, in their defense, there's a lot of people channel surfing, right? And, you know, you just might land on a Hulu <laughs> documentary and you won't know where you are. Yeah, you might you find yourself watching, you know, this original movie and you don't know if it's original or where you got there or where you yeah. are. Yeah, I. It's one of those things where it's like I'm watching this. I'm like. I'm going to be the guy on the street corner with the pamphlet and everybody's going to look at me like, just ignore it. And I'll be like, no, you, you can't. It's just, it's there. I do wonder whether, is that just like a, a piracy thing? Like, do they want like to make sure that anybody who watches this at any point knows that it's a Hulu thing? Oh, well, considering that AMC, who, who... like the, like there was the AMC, like the terror was AMC. So it was the AMC. They put, I think the networks, I don't know. I, I, I would say of the independent uh, uh, cable alternatives, uh, Hulu is the one that that strives to be the most TV like. It's the place where if you missed it when it was on broadcast TV, you go to Hulu to see it. So it doesn't surprise me that it would ape the tropes of of television in, in that regard. Not to mention I, you I, have I, all the broadcasters providing the content who I'm sure want the recognition because they would already put those bugs on their show anyway. Uh, when they yeah, I think that's uh, Bryce. I think, that, I think that's right. Is I think I yeah. The reason is is because like it was an AMC show on Hulu, so the AMC wants to make sure you know this is from AMC. Have you seen it, FX? It, FX is like built, burning those into their shows. Like a few seasons in Archer, you can at the beginning of the of the intro graphics it says FX presents in the opening title sequence of the show. Hmm. So like they're kind of recognizing that you know like if you watch it on Netflix, you wouldn't see the FX logo, but now. If you see those seasons, yeah, they're realizing that right there's in. there's a, a dormant uh, brand space that they can uh, say uh, pee on it and say, "Hey, this is our thing. Yeah. We're it's us." Yeah. FX, uh, fix. Well, that's true, you, <laughs> Andrew. That's because you're the only one who will you say stop FX. Uh, all right. So, what was this documentary, Andrew? The documentary in question is the. Uh, Either the untitled Amazing Jonathan documentary or the Amazing Jonathan documentary. Uh, it's been released as the Amazing Jonathan documentary. I think it. Not, I think it was called the Untitled Amazing Jonathan documentary at Sundance, where Hulu picked it up. So I think that's where yeah. the conf- confusion comes from. Yeah. So it's it's about the comedy magician Jonathan Sizzlale's Amazing Jonathan, who uh, is a really awesome guy. Um, I think we've all met him. We've all all interacted with Jonathan, AJ, and he's he is very, very, very much beloved by people here, by us, because I think growing up as either people who like comedy or magic or whatever, Jonathan is so friggin' hilarious. And I, I don't think it's possible for him to have a bad show because his just energy is incredible. And so the documentary is focusing on him, which was I was super excited to see that Jonathan was going to get a doc. I saw I've been around him and seen some of the documentary stuff being done about him, you know, and, you know, more of that in there. But so this is what we all watch to talk about. Reactions. Uh, Okay, so for context, uh, I believe I'm the only person who sat through all of the other documentary. Uh, If you're not familiar, if you haven't seen the trailer, this is sort of a meta documentary about the fact that halfway through making this documentary, uh, the filmmaker finds out that there's another documentary being made. Uh, The other one came out first, uh, and I I sat through it. It was uh, it was a real slog. I. Uh, it, the whole thing was just a love letter, and uh, they they gloss over some of the most interesting parts about you know like his his uh, famous drug use and insanity, and instead it's just like uh, here's another great thing I did, and then I did this other great thing, and then I pulled this great par- prank or whatever. 
I didn't care for it. It wasn't for me. So when I saw the preview for this, I was stoked. I was stoked because it looked like there were stakes and that it was uh, subversive and it was going to set out to be the opposite of what the other one was. And uh, I think uh, in large part it delivered. It certainly was the opposite of the other one in that the other one stayed with Jonathan being the focus the entire movie long, whereas this one on Hulu, about halfway through, it's like, uh, or you know what else I could do is turn the camera on me. <laughs> so let's have it be the me show. And uh, uh, it's fine. You know, it's it's a weird take to, uh, for at least a portion of the show, to set up and hint that the subject is actually the villain. And, uh, you know, it doesn't end up that way. Spoiler alert. But, um uh, I, I liked it uh, for, for, for what it was, and uh, I, I could totally understand why somebody would watch it and it would turn out to not be anything they were hoping to see. But if what you want to see is a documentary filmmaker turn the camera on himself and talk about how complicated it is that he's about to smoke meth with a, a, a comedy legend, uh, boy, do I have the documentary for you. But then it – I may not – and my my charisma is like that to mark to me part to me didn't then it was like and that's when it stopped being a documentary and it was a film a guy made to look like a it was like catfish catfish came out i'm like well this is fake and people are like what and if you think catfish is real it's a very interesting thing if right. you go no this is all fake it falls apart you're like oh this isn't really good yeah it's definitely and, pro wrestling and i and i think that's the biggest difference is oh, i went no, into saying, it no, i i'm sorry I interrupt you for a second everybody knows pro wrestling is fake Catfish was put out there, people thinking this was real, and like, oh, wow, I can't believe you got this. It's so insightful to see this. And you're like, no, that was faked. And then you go, oh, then it's not that, that oh, yeah, that was a bad performance. That was a bad this. And so I, my, my, I would say it's a very different context. I, I, I perceived very early in this movie that everybody was in on it, and I held on to that the entire movie long. And I, and, uh, there, I think there were moments of genuine interaction or whatever, but, but it seemed pretty clear to me that there was some discussion uh, between Amazing Jonathan and the filmmaker where it was like, hey, surprise me, subvert this, uh, go nuts, we'll see what we get. Uh, and and <laughs> this episode of After Thing brought to you by Crackle. Uh, <laughs> Bryce just put the Crackle bug up in the corner. That's great. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I didn't feel any need to feel betrayed or annoyed because I just assumed the entire time that there's moments of... of uh, there are genuine moments, but in general, it seems to me like the amazing Jonathan explicitly told the filmmaker, Hey, try to surprise me. Uh, let's see what you got. I, I guess it's not a matter of, I guess for me, it's like when it goes over to the filmmaker story, I felt like this is, these scenes are staged. He, he, he's talking on the phone and what feels like it's all the sta things you do after the fact in the documentary coming from like, you know, producing reality TV. What do you do when you, you need to make these elms? Oh, well, I'm going to go in my car. We're going to record me having this conversation. We'll reenact this conversation. We'll reenact this. We'll go do this. We'll go do that. And that, that was like, and it just felt like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a documentary now cliche. You know, I felt like, you know, you remember the doctor like searching for, you know, Larson or whatever. It was like, yeah. Yeah, it was that. I'm I'm watching all of those tropes happen now, and and they're not. It's not entertaining to me because if you want to go there, then go there. Go to where you really want to go. So, I thought that the movie was certainly well executed to the point where, like Andrew, I began to suspect. Okay, well. I, be I began to suspect its construction <laughs> at, at the point where it's like all these kind of uh, very in structure, although sometimes tone, uh, comedic sort of moments are sort of strung together, whether they have punchlines or not. Uh, I was initially very intrigued by the trailer because it dealt with kind of two elements. One, that is something that is kind of understood and talked about and I wouldn't talk about publicly unless it was in this movie that we're talking about now which is uh, uh, Amazing Jonathan's drug use and uh, the idea that look he is you know now four years past when he got a death diagnosis and he has been very open about uh, you know his his health and if there is an element that I felt betrayed on it is that the movie hinges by the end of it on the 
documentarian's relationship with Jonathan vis-a-vis the fact that Jonathan is dying to the point where, and it's hinted in the trailer, that there's a confrontation between the documentarian and Jonathan about whether or not he is fabricating his illness. Um, that's something where it's like, you you have to deliberately build up to that point, and I only hope that this is something that they all were uh, uh, that they were all on on the same page about. Because if they weren't, then it's something that I've kind of become more uncomfortable with the longer I got away from the ending. I thought the ending was very very touching, and as soon as the movie was over, I was very happy with my experience, but. Man, it's 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 a complicated thing, and uh, if if all of a sudden, you know, we get word from you know people that we know that are close to them, and uh, uh, you know, AJ and and Anastasia, that um, like, oh no, like we wanted to set out to make a transgressive, grab you by the throat, yet more impactful than you were thinking, kind of mockumentary documentary and that's what we did and and we're very happy with the output then i'll be a lot happier with it but the way it is now it's like man uh uh i i get it on some level if it's like amazing jonathan should have if you're gonna capture his spirit and his chaos then maybe the documentary should be weird and jagged and more emotional than it should be and a little bit too, too real than it should be. Uh, but on the other hand, considering that the movie does do, a, a, I think, a very effective job by the end, portraying a very frail, confused uh, uh, drug addict who almost certainly will die before his mother, like, that's a little more like, all right, so we're telling this story, which is really about the documentarian at using this guy as a backdrop. And like, if they're not in on it, then that's something that bothers me more. Uh, the more I've sat with the movie. I, you know, and I, I guess a little bit sort of frustrating for me was is the camera is the documentary turned the camera on himself, which, now is a thing that you do because you decide you got to be as important as your subject in some cases, which drives me nuts because sometimes I want to watch a thing about a thing, not hear the story about the person making the thing because you realize, man, I, I'm able to attach myself to this thing, whatever. It, it, it irritates me like a bit. But Benjamin Berm is an interesting guy. He's got, you know, you the only thing you know about him is you see this quick little like screen grab in the frame of the uh, in one frame or one little quick cut where you realize this guy's worked on shows like Comedy Bang Bang, Tim and Eric. He's a, an accomplished comedy director. He's got his own pedigree and stuff. You know nothing about that for him, which to me, it's like, if you want to turn the camera on yourself, then tell us a little bit about you. Like, why Why is this? the Because it, it became, the act, the structures are almost based around like the, the, the sense of his feeling of the sense of betrayal. And it's like, OK, we have a big thing. You lost your mom when that was young. And that's a touching moment. And that's a real moment. But he's devoid us of knowing anything about him or the consequences because there's you know i'm going to spoil alert scenery uses he decides to use meth because to convince jonathan to let him use show jonathan using meth on screen which is just felt like jonathan called it out right in the moment are you trying to be vice but who are you like i don't know like you know you you seemed very eager to do this what do you what do we need to know about you as the filmmaker to know why you did this which you're not telling us because you get control over this, which was frustrating to me. So. Yeah, I, I thought they did a a, a bit of that by <clears throat> showing the you know his his early video footage and interviewing his parents and all that stuff. Um, uh, but well, but that, I guess that, it that, didn't that, land. that stuff was very effective to me. Like the the like watching his mom slowly wither away, and then like this interview with his dad like you know months after the mom passed away while he's like zooming in on his friend or brother or cousin mugging you know uh, uh behind his like dad breaking down like that's like there, there's some crazy 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 footage in there it's just i don't know go ahead but then we jump forward to the guy making i'm like who are you like who are you like like we get some shots of your house 
you know, and, and also in any documentary, too, there's the things that you don't know, like family members that aren't on camera that you would never know because, you know, like, I don't want to be in this. And so the, you, we create this. All documentaries are, are a, a, a narrative and, and you watch and, you know, you you watch from reality TV shows, you find out like, oh, yeah, no, there's a sister that's not on the show because you don't want to here. You know, the family members are not. And with the filmmaker, it's like you've hidden so much of who you are here and what you have put on there to me felt like, I, yeah, I believe he was surprised by the other documentaries being made and the Matthews thing. Like, I believe there's a, like, I think those moments are real, but the way he tried to tell the story was felt faked and forced and added and stuff. And it's like, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm, as a documentary about Jonathan, you're going to walk away not really, you'll get an idea of a bit of who he is as a person. He's a sweet, sincere person that can be the most truthful person you can talk to. Um, you get some of that. You get Anastasia, who who is uh, darling. I love her. She's she's you know is supportive of this person that has got to be an incredibly difficult person to deal with at times. You get you get to see them, which I'm glad for that. Um, and and I understand it's not a documentary about him. It's about a documentary about trying to make a documentary where he's the subject. And that's where I feel like if that's what it wanted to be, they could have could have done a better job of that. I mean, that's like the whole conflict at the end of the movie though, right? Is like, hey, if the point of my documentary is to get the most footage of you until you die and then put it out after you die so I have the footage of you uh, posthumously, like like that I mean, that's the central conflict of the die. It you know, it's it's well, it it, it, it becomes it becomes, yeah, sure. Because you are like slowly resolving all these other things that mm -hmm. are, by the way, the things that kind of sell you on watching it. How well, many? Right? I mean, it felt like it felt like the missing Richard Simmons sort of idea thing a little bit of like, hey, you know, we kind of this is actually not a big issue. Let's just like find out it's 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 not exactly the same situation, but it felt it felt a little bit like that of, you know, the plan narrative kind of coming to a, an abrupt halt. Um, but in this case, it was whether the documentarian felt he was being exploitative of, of Jonathan's death or not. Well, and, and I think that um, that's why I didn't mind all of the things that were obviously faked and shot after, uh, shot after the fact. Because when you begin this kind of project, you know, this four-year project, uh, nobody knows how it's going to end. And so you just grab everything, and then the story unfolds. You know, in this case, it was multiple documentaries. So it's like uh, at some point, you get a strong sense of what the first documentary to come out is going to do. And by virtue of having our Already covered the bases it's like okay let's assume everybody's seen the first documentary so what do we, what is the story that we want to tell that is uh, truthful here's here's the real truth um uh, me the documentarian was told that i would be the uh, the sole person and it turns out i'm not and i'm going through this experience of feeling betrayed and let's see what we could get of that and it then, becomes like a mini true crime almost sort of story where it's not about the subject anymore it's about hey what happened here is is there something actually different here? Yeah, well, and and they're like, but that, but what are and what are the pieces and what story that we could tell that is uh, uh, essentially true? Given mm -hmm. these pieces that we have, okay, now what are the missing gaps? And one of those missing gaps are there has to be something to introduce me to the audience. So let me find some old clips of my family. Let me get my dad in there. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, now we're at the point where well, there has to be you know a win condition at the end. So you know, let's take this one minor part from before and at least we can make things right with that and uh, mm -hmm. i mean all of that um uh, maybe 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 uh, your frustration andrew is just that it wasn't a documentary like it uh it flat out was not a documentary and it does say in the title that it's a documentary uh well, I, I i i guess i mean my yeah i mean certainly the the you know he it, it felt good you could argue that like Hey, I'm gonna the documentary decided, you know what? I'll make it about me making this thing about him and 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 me getting redemption and me doing this and make he turned the camera on himself, which it's fine. I didn't care that part didn't it didn't I didn't feel emotional. I didn't re, it didn't feel good. It didn't feel well done. I felt like this is when it got boring. This is when I didn't enjoy it because this is when it sort of was a cliche of every other documentary. It's like you watch documentary now and you watch them do the cliche and the tropes. And it's like 
now is when Fred Armisen's character decides he's going to make himself the center of the story. You know, now is when his Fred Armisen has decided to pull his parents into this thing for no reason other than to give background. You and know now what? we're putting I... our subject way into off screen. And it's like there's that, you know, what I'm talking about the, which yeah. one, the oh, searching for Yeah, Larson. absolutely. It uh, was searching for Gary Larson. The, um, uh, it was a it was that was a template for this. It was amazing. It really was, and and uh, I would say that having seen documentary now almost certainly uh, shapes <laughs> your your experience of this because they are so good on that show. If you're not familiar in the audience, uh, documentary now is, is is a series of parody uh, documentaries, and it's it's brilliant. Uh, everybody should watch it. And and the searching for. It's, the plot is, yeah. you know, Fred Armisen plays, and it's based on sort of this loosely in the bill, the the one the searching for Bill Watterson, mm -hmm. the guy who did Calvin and Hobbes. And this one, Fred Armisen's character sets out to find Gary Larson, who doesn't want to be found or whatever. And then he increasingly says, you know what? I found that, you know, the real thing is the story is me. It's really about me. And that's playing through my head about this. Like, hey, we have this guy that has an amazing legacy in show business. It's touched so many lives we're going to talk to these people up front, but we're never going to talk to them again. We're going to tell you he did things, but then we're not going to tell you about his rise or what he did or the real the, the, the nightmare of kind of things, what's going on there. I'm going to tell you about my story, about making this story about this guy. And I'm like, who do I think is more interesting as far as I know? Benjamin Berman, Amazing Jonathan, Amazing Jonathan. So when we went to Berman, I'm like, yeah, making documentaries is hard. <laughs> You know, well, especially because what makes the conflicts special enough to include in a documentary predicates or you need to predicate it with like, is Jonathan at the base level a total asshole at the worst? This like Svengali who like God knows how many people in his orbit are, are kind of there through him, like either emotional abuse or, or something else, it, you know, because otherwise it's like, if it's just, Oh, we had scheduling conflicts and uh, uh, it turns out he forgot about this other documentary thing because he's on so much medication. Those aren't conflicts that you can make a docu that you can even put into a self-serving kind of documentary. Like this one is, it has to be, no, he's being, personally antagonistic and this is consistent with how he treats other people in his life and it's uh, uh oh wait hold on and this is the big moment in the in the trailer is like is he fabricating his illness and what ramifications does that have on this story and that is something where it's like by the time that we got to the end i'm like oh good i feel like i feel good about where everybody is at the end of this story but also Oh God! Like, really? We spent the majority of our story looking at this frail, dying legend, uh, a comedy legend, magic legend, beloved amongst his peers, uh, who has a drug problem. We made him the Moriarty to your Sherlock, uh, uh, before realizing that it was that things were were confused. Like, that's that's where I'm like I'm like ugh. I mean because. This is again, or I hope that this is something that was all kind of set up because I'm cool if everyone's playing a version of themselves. If it's if this is about and and if if Jonathan is like, hey, look, uh, I got a punk rock documentary that is like raw, real, and captivating. Uh, raw, real, and captivating are you know definitions of his art writ large. Uh, uh, I, I think that that's that's cool if he's. You know, if that that was something laid out, and even if he likes it now, I mean, who knows? I don't know. It, it, it was a very conflicting thing uh, uh, to watch it because, you know, look, all the negative stuff that's talked about in that documentary, uh, I've heard it from people that love him dearly, like that that no matter what, care about him uh, uh, and and want him to be understood and recognized and and live for as long as he possibly can past his diagnosis uh it, it it did not feel like that was kind of what i got from this i just kind of got a lot of skeletons being swept into the into the foreground so we could set up this mystery and then resolve it at the end and it's like oh wow we really swept all those skeletons out there to set up that payoff huh i 
I think, I mean, everybody who's listening has interest, watch it. Absolutely watch it because as you see the reactions from here, you know, we are, are you know, it, it, and, and that tells you right there. It's, 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 po- interesting. it's powerful it's, art. Like, uh, uh, it, love it, it or hate it, you're going to feel something. I, I, and maybe not what the filmmaker intended in my case, but you're, you're, it, 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 it does a thing. And I, I, I want to. So our comment, B. Viper said Michael Moore murdered the door document. I'm going to defend Michael Moore here, okay? And 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 well, I'm not going to defend Clip his this. use Clip of it. what's that? Clip this for posterity. Yeah, I, I I mean his I won't defend his facts and things like that, which are even in Roger and me. He said things just were not true and inconsistent, or things like this and all that. And that's and I'm not going to try to get into the actual substance of what he says or whatever because I won't defend that. But making himself the subject of it, I don't have a problem with that because in actuality, like when he did Roger and me, what he did was part of it was let's give a face to somebody from Flint, Michigan. But more documentaries treat their sub. You're you're supposed to think these things are objective presentations of what's going on, that like this is the thing that happened. And if there's nobody on screen to be the voice or the face of the documentary, we tend to believe these things. If it feels like news and stuff, we think these things are real. The more you learn about how these things are made or the more you know about a topic, you realize Oh no! Like they chose this clip, this the sound bite out of like three hours of interview, and the person answered a different question, but it makes them look bad. You know they have agendas. You know the documentary. Everybody who makes a documentary has an agenda, and it's not the it's not. I want to give a fair you know fair view of this. It's like no, they have a point of view they want to get across. Michael Moore at the very at defending him. He put his face out there so you understood the point of view. You what? understood who was saying this, who was making this argument. And I have no problem with that style of a documentarian like, hey, I wanted to find out more, whatever, blah, 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 blah. And this is going to be shaped from my point of view of how I see things. And I think that's it's also a lot less complicated of a storytelling device. If there's uh, if you're if you're doing a traditional narrative uh, documentary, it's hard to say the story is blank. But then we found out blank. And now we think blank. Like that's hard to do Mm -hmm. unless there's a human being that we Mm -hmm. can go on that journey with. And so I think uh, I I think a lot of Michael Moore's uh, uh, stories, I'm fine with that, that, that trope or whatever. Mm -hmm. And also, especially with Roger, me, it's kind of faded in in his work since then. But Roger and me, I think was in part a hit because he sort of played a character. He was this like, kind of useful idiot character of like, I'm from Flint. Like, Next thing you know, all the factories closed. So I'm going to go ask the CEO why the factories closed. And it's like, this is, I'm sure that there's an element of Michael Moore that does that, but it's not like him doing these kinds of like gonzo elements are theatrical. Like he's, he's doing a, 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 a bit. He's using the kind of like uh, invest like I team TV sort of uh, sort of idea to tell a story from his perspective. Uh, I don't know. Uh, 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 I still like Roger. Roger is good. All right. Uh, All right. We've now moved beyond this. Uh, Anyway, I I think our review is see it uh, and feel whatever you feel uh, for the amazing Jonathan documentary. I I will just also say the lounge lizards half hour of amazing Jonathan. If you want to like that is seared into my brain is one of those things that it was just on comedy central uh, like, in my mind every day at the same time i think i must have watched it 50,000 times uh uh and it, it is kind of the core of uh the like act that that made him famous it is it, it is, is the I mean, seminal performance that uh that for you at least will always be like the oh, one. That, uh, amazing jonathan to me will always be that that lounge lizards half hour on comedy central so if you can find it go go check that out because uh you know he does deserve to be understood as uh, as revolutionary uh, a a comedy and magic act as he he really was. Yeah, there's there's the and I and again it, the you, you have to separate like well what I would like to have seen versus you know what the documentary show goes to follow is like his story is a very interesting one. It like you know Merv Griffin loved him right, so Merv Griffin produced a game show with with Jonathan hosting this and that was this attempt to take this manic energy this this likability and take it and put into some other medium and I was I'm fascinated by that because it's like you meet people in magic you go man 
if we put this person in this other thing, they would be amazing. You know, if so-and-so wasn't doing magic, they were just a host, they would be fantastic. And that's one of these things, it's like, I'm like, uh, you know, one of the many facets of him, I'm like, man, yeah, I wish we knew more That's about all that. in the other documentary. Uh, definitely yeah. check that out. In fact, everybody check them both out. Hey, Always, uh, always Amazing is what the other one is called. Always. It's still on YouTube. Uh, right on, man. Uh, I, I hate to chase this off, but I got to go get, get prepped because uh, we're down one Tom Merritt on Cord Killers. Well, you're up one and your main. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> that, that's me. I'm Andrew Main, so I'll be on there. Uh, any quick picks? I guess our pick will be this documentary. Yeah. yeah. Go go see it. Uh, now, the one thing I will be, the, I think we can end on this coda, is uh, – I do wonder whether or not it's going to be an award thing because it's certainly gotten a lot of press and traditionally documentaries that get a lot of press wind up, you know, like it, there's noms. not getting them yeah. nom nom noms. Well, so it's been after. All right. Hey, good work, everybody. Good job, team. Uh, we are going to uh, cut and run just a little bit quick today. Because uh, we got to do some extra prep today for Cord Killers. But thank you everybody for watching. We'll be back in a few hours. Justin, you on a stream later today? or? Uh, no, that? tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll be back with the politics stream. And other than that, just rock and roll. Yeah. And, and then, uh, yeah, we'll be in uh, Austin. I'll be in Austin on Friday. Oh, right. a lot wow, Friday. Oh, that's earlier than I thought. Very cool. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll not be here when you get in. Because I have a show on Saturday. And I get back <laughs> Wait, on Sunday. You're going... Wait, where are you? Where are you doing a show? Uh, Embry Riddle Aeronautical University on Saturday with uh, Nate Staniforth. Yeah. Nice. Very cool. Yeah, so we'll trash can. the house while you're gone. Yeah. yeah a big house I'll, party. I'll take a poop in your shower. Ooh. Waffle stomp. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Have a good night, everybody. We'll be back soon. Bye. <laughs>